How's everyone feeling? The faith, the faith thing is really good, isn't it? Like, just to remember that all the time, faith. It's a, it's a very powerful thing to remember. Yeah. So what, what's kept me going in my own progression? Now, obviously, a lot of my own progression, I've been totally alone in the sense that no one, no one able to help me, no one able to determine what's sort of wrong inside of me emotionally, and no one be able to help me what's wrong in terms of where I'm out of harmony with love and things like that, aside from uh, my connection with God. So what I've had to do is have a lot of faith that if I just keep processing, keep working my way through these issues, keep acting in harmony with love, everything will come out in the end. I'll be able to find out what's going on with myself in the end. So that's been something that's really very, very important to me. Um, and, and you'll find very important to your own progression as well. Faith also, by the way, is not easily shaken. See, a lot of people feel that faith is something that's very indeterminate and without any power. The reality is that true faith cannot be really shaken. So no matter how many people I've had tell me that I'm an idiot for doing what I'm doing and I'm an idiot for saying what I'm saying and things like that, and you know, right from family, friends, mo pretty much all of my friends uh, that I have now, I didn't have, like I said, about five years ago. All, all of them changed. Um, all of the family, uh, um, for a quite some period of time, were like the same as well for, towards me. And so, so what that meant was that if if your faith is easily shaken you would not keep going under those circumstances, would you? You'd, you'd just give up and say, oh, I've had enough of this, it's all too hard. Whereas, whereas a faith that's real doesn't easily give up. You look at all the people that have ever been leaders in their field, in the forefront of their field, right the way through history, they've always had lots and lots of people ostracise them and criticise them and ridicule them and tell them that they're stupid and that, that they had the wrong motives and everything else. And and yet they continued doing what they did. And the only reason why they did is because they had faith that it would all come out and again. And quite often, the very people who ridicule you, a year or two later, are the same people who love you. That's something for you to remember when you get ridiculed, right? <laughs> you see, you imagine like, if you're the first member of your entire family to get to divine truth, and you work through a lot of things, yourself with regard to the divine truth and you've gone through lots of opposition and had to work your way through all those issues and later down the track they all start hearing the divine truth for themselves at the soul level do you think they're going to go ah oh, yeah you should never have done that in the first case uh, of course they're not going to they're going to say to you oh, it's wonderful that you did what you did and you stood up for your you know you stood up for your faith and you stood up for what you believed was right at the time because if you hadn't have then where would I be now? Because I, I, I would actually be in this place where I would never have heard the truth either. And so there's just this real beautiful thing that comes out from you having faith and this next quality, courage as well. Are you going to join me in this conversation or you wanted to? Oh, I, can, I can sit down. You wanted to join? Or? Yeah, it's triggering the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a negative way, I'm just feeling all of my inadequacy feelings. <laughs> yeah, okay, no worries. Uh, but um, I, honestly, I'm fine to sit down. I'm perfectly happy for you to stay. <laughs> it just felt like, I don't know why I'm here, I don't know why I'm here, is where the feeling comes from. No, no, I, I probably had that before the break, but now I'm... Myself and Mary, we've been talking a lot with, between each other about um, this these feelings that Mary has too of sometimes feeling um, what she does is she feels the projection of an audience she then worries about whether her what how she will be judged in terms of in, when she's in her passion and then uh, yeah you I back think it's more fair to say with this audience I'm not really feeling their projection but I'm living in my fear about projection yeah yeah and uh, I actually have lots of passion and I'm quite verbose at other times about what we're talking about in the past and then I get up here and I go oh and this is why I sometimes look at <laughs> this is why I sometimes look at Mary and go why aren't you saying anything right now like this is this is one of the biggest things you're normally on about like yeah. and uh, 
And it's because of these unhealed emotions that Mary's working her way through about um, the past, really. It's fear, yeah, really. It's yeah. not, I don't feel it's about this audience at all. Yeah. This is like a, yeah. 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 So, so um, these, and, go on. Yeah. <laughs> I also have the feeling of like, you've got it covered, you know, what can I add? And so I, um, that's, but that's my hiding. I use that yeah, to hide. Mary, Mary yeah. keeps sort of backing out of her passion. You use that as an excuse to back out of your passion, don't you? Like, yeah. So it's like, if, if AJ's in his passion doing it, then I can get away with not demonstrating my passion yeah. doing it. Does that make sense? Like there's this, there's those emotions going on. So. Yeah. Yeah. Which of course myself and Mary have talked about a lot. Because you, you haven't seen this girl yet. Right. <laughs> I've had 2,000 years of her, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and it's so share. much fun. <laughs> and, uh, and when she's in her real passion um, and, and really in the zone, and you'll find that happening over the coming years. Um, <laughs> over the coming years, it might take. And, and you'll find uh, that you'll start seeing Mary's real personality and, and not this, this person who's backing off a little uh, at the moment. And uh, it's, yeah, you'll find and fe come to love her, not quite so much as I do, but I'm sure you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> love you, darling. Yeah. All right. Let's talk, about Let's talk about courage. All right. Um, Courage is one of those qualities that uh, we often use on the planet in a very negative connotation. So in other words, it's like, yeah, he went to war and he had courage. Do you know what I mean? Whereas actually I feel the person who's gone to war has not really demonstrated a huge amount of courage by even going to war, uh, really. Not harmonious with divine love or truth, at least. Having real courage... Um, is that uh, courage itself is a very important quality in your progression. Without it, you will often succumb to firstly either your own weaknesses or the weaknesses of the environment that get projected upon you and then determine your actions. So firstly, courage is something that is an inner, is an inner strength, but it comes in the end, GT. Yeah, um, but it comes um, not always from within. In the sense that um, you can have courage, particularly when you know other people are supporting you. Right. So, so for example, if if somebody said to you, "Ah." Oh, it, this happened yesterday, right, where somebody, was, I think yourself, mentioned that you wanted to do some jumping out of a plane, right? You booked it. Awesome. Well, awesome. Okay. There's action. There's action there. That's awesome. Anyway, so there's four of you. Four, four of you going. You're going too, far. Okay. Awesome. Right. It's going to be pretty weird, isn't it? Anyway, so, so you've, had, you've had the feeling of courage, but remember what you said. You said... I would like to do it with three other people so that I feel locked into it. Now that's no longer courage anymore. You follow me? Like what's happening there is no longer is it courage anymore, it's now camaraderie that's helping you get through these particular that particular thing. Does that make sense? Having people with you. Ah, but commitment is not courage. This is what I'm trying to point out to you. <laughs> Right? So, so while you do feel committed to doing it, that doesn't necessarily mean at this point that you have a courage in doing it. Because if you feel about it, it's like all the bowels turn to water almost, right? <laughs> That's how it feels. So, so the reality is that the, the emotion of courage is yet to be present there. Right? Now, obviously, courage is very much assisted by other people doing the same thing as you. Right? So in other words, if you the only person in this entire audience who has to own up to an emotion, now that's pretty hard, isn't it? That means getting hold of the microphone, everybody else in the room potentially judging you and so forth. That's, uh, that's uh, one thing. But if you know that there's 50 other people in the audience having the same feeling, 
Now it's a lot easier to demonstrate some courage. Does that make sense? So in the end, the type of courage we want is this. That if I am the only person I will still do it. And personally, I think there's a lot of people in this audience who have um, some of that courage because a lot mm. of you are the only people in your family who are doing it and that's, there's a lot of pressure in that. Yeah. So already you are demonstrating a degree of courage because a lot of times you're getting pressure from family, pressure from friends, people going, oh, he's a bit of an idiot now, what's going on there? And, and that's, you know, all this projection coming at you are from all these different areas and not only projection but many of you have started to also experience the behind the scenes manipulation that goes on inside of a family in order to break your courage down right, and get you back to where you were. So that is also happening for many too. There's this behind the scenes manipulation to get everything back to the status quo. In the end the kind of courage that we want is the kind of courage where an, not another person on this planet needs to agree with me but I will still do it. Right? Now most people on the planet would call that stupidity <laughs> but that's the kind of courage we're going to need in our progression towards God. And if we, how do we, I suppose the question then becomes well how do I get that courage? And there's basically two ways. One is by releasing your fears how do you release your fear? Do you remember how to release your fear? Well, no, it's not just feeling it. Because what is fear? False expectations appearing real. So fear is the false expectations appearing real to you. So how can you also help, help release your fear? What I can do is correct it with, okay, the truth. Right? So I have to come to face the truth emotionally inside of myself and that will help me correct a lot of my fears. So that's one aspect of courage. As you release fear and you do that by allowing yourself to confront and feel about the truth, as you release the fear and the fear lessens, obviously your courage will increase. So you have more courage. But that is not the only thing that's going to help you because in the end if you release all your fears and you get all the truth you might not necessarily still have all the courage you need and the reason why is because there's this aspect of courage related to love and not just truth right? and this is something that I often feel about myself and think about is that even if what I'm doing doesn't feel to anybody else to be the truth. Is this thing that I'm doing based on a loving act or desire within myself? And it's my attachment to love that helps me have courage. D does that make sense to you? It's a bit if like... You, yeah. If you desire to love enough, that will give you the courage to face whatever it is, even yeah. if you're the only person with that desire in that situation. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so for me, courage is also not just about the truth and knowing the truth and feeling about the truth, but there are times in your progression where you don't know the truth. But you often do know what love would do in that situation. Does that make sense to everyone? So you might not know the truth, but you know that you getting angry, for example, is not loving. So you might be getting angry about a thing that you think is true, but you know that the anger itself is unloving. So you have to have the courage to feel what's underneath the anger rather than project it out at the universe. And what gives me that courage is, do I want to be loving in this moment or, or not? So for me, for me, one thing that I focus on is being loving. If you love, if you love then, and you're, you're actually desiring love in every aspect of your life, now 
you can stay firm about what is love, what you know to be love within yourself, no matter what happens around you. So there are times inside of myself that I am shaking with fear, but I still go ahead and do the loving thing. Does that make sense? Can, can I add to that as well from my own point of view? When um, often on this path I've realised that I have a fear. So, okay, I've got a fear of um, being in truth with my family or I've got a fear of jumping out of an aeroplane or whatever. And I go, okay, I'm going to confront the fear. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Um, but where I've fallen down in the past, especially in relationships, is that I've gone, right, I'm going to do it, I know what the right thing is to do and I'm going to do it. But because I haven't kept love in mind, love of myself and love of everyone in the interaction, I haven't been vulnerable emotionally. I've like dragged myself through it and gone, this is the truth and that's how it is and right, I'm going. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and really it's almost like a wasted thing. I did, the real fear was around the vulnerability and being loving to myself in that situation. Mm -hmm. So that's where the true courage comes, not when I gra grab myself by the ponytail and drag myself through my fear, but when I, I, I have enough love for myself to feel my emotions while it's happening. Mm -hmm. That's, that's been a really powerful thing for me to understand. I'm looking at you. Okay. <laughs> so why are you looking at me? Like I, think, I think I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm not trusting myself to share what I feel. Yeah. 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 So, so what Mary was saying is really important to understand is that, is that you can be courageous even when you're full of fear. Right? As long as you as love is the motivating factor for you. Right? So there are times in your progression when you're not yet at one with God. Because, of course, when you're at one with God, you now know the full truth, so there is no fear. Does that make sense to you? But ironically, at that point, you're also the most courageous, not just because you're now in a state of truth, but because you're, but because you're now in a state of perfected love. So if you focus on the love part of courage, it will help you do what needs to be done to help you confront different emotions. So when I, oftentimes like I feel like, all right, I'm feeling a bit like frustrated here. Frustration is anger. Anger means that I'm now avoiding an emotion. Therefore, I'm lacking the courage to actually allow myself to feel the emotion. Why is that? What, what, why am I willing to be unloving in this manner towards myself or if I'm angry with others towards others? And if I focus on this quality of love and how that will affect my courage, so I just write love like that, and how that affects my courage, then I will always be able to maintain my courage even though I'm in a state of fear, even though I don't really feel like I have the inner strength to go through it. And this is where a lot of reliance on God comes in. Now, we'll have a talk in the future about God reliance in terms of the whole subject, right? But if you can see that if, I'm, if I am reliant on God enough to trust that if I am loving in all places and at all times, what's going to happen is every single thing within me is going to be released at some point, then what I will do is I'll have the courage to face the fearful circumstances that come up every time issues of truth are confronted or is every time issues with my family are confronted or every time issues with authority are confronted or whatever it is that I'm afraid of. I will maintain this courage, this courageous state within myself. Now, for many people, they realise that if you have fear, then you can't have much courage, but they don't realise that you can still have fear as long as you focus on the love part that's related to courage you, you will be able to get through any fear. And what I'm noticing a lot lately is that many who are progressing on the divine love path are struggling with their fear. Right? And the reason why we're struggling with our fear is because firstly we're not facing the fact that actually we can, we can be courageous because love is always going to be the best possible action to take in any situation. And therefore, 
we will get through any fear if we focus on that. So a lot of times we spend a lot of our emotional energy focused on something. And a lot of times it's the focus that we have on our fear rather than on the positive aspects of our own progression. And remember, if, how can we passionately desire positively cha positive change within us if we're focusing on the negative of the change? It's, very, it's going to be very difficult to be passionately desirous of something that's going to happen positively in the end if I'm focused all the time on the negative. Now, one way we can help rejig our focus is by firstly, in every situation, focusing on what would love do? What would, even, even good enough would be, what would my current understanding of love do? From an intellectual perspective, my current understanding of love, what would it do in this situation? Right? And down the track you may find that that current understanding had further learning to do, that's fine. Act in harmony with what you feel love would do right at the moment and have the courage to follow through on it because you love the whole concept of love. Over there, thank you, Sol. It just, yeah, it's okay. It. Yeah, yeah um, I'm just uh, uh, trying to follow through a little bit on what Mary was saying. Um, what came to mind was um, uh, determination and I was trying to work out where that fitted in, in terms of courage. And when you said love, I realised that I have quite a lot of determination, but I also have a lot of struggle with my determination. And I could see that my focus was on, I'll get it done, or I'll do it, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And because it wasn't focused on being that vulnerable, um, I got fixed on the, I'm going to get it done bit. And I missed the point of it. So when I did actually achieve what I was aiming for, and this is before I went on this path, I didn't have a sense of, wow, I've done it. It was more like, oh, okay, I got through that. I got through that. Yeah. yeah. And, and people often said, well, you are courageous. And I felt, not really. And, and now it sort of clicked into place that this big element of love, mm -hmm. which um, I found that... I've started to ask when I'm in a, a difficult situation, uh, what is the most loving thing to do? And I'm sometimes I don't know. And I'll go, okay, let's try it this way. And it's not always the, the most loving thing to do, but it's closer. Mm -hmm. And I've been in a very vulnerable position of not knowing and hoping that I wasn't doing more damage. But having followed through it with it, that hope, I don't know if that fits in, but mm. <laughs> that hope that it wasn't wrong. Mm. Um, even if it started off very wobbly as maybe not quite so loving, it turns out quite loving mm. because I carried through being vulnerable with it. Exactly. Yeah. As long as you're humble on this path, mm. you're going to get to love in the end. You know, as long as you're willing to look at yourself and willing to feel your emotion uh, and, and you're striving to be loving, you're going to get there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good illustration too about determination. You see, a lot of, oftentimes we can heavy ourselves through lots of different things, but that's not loving to myself. Yeah. Yeah. So straight away I'm out of harmony with love, and that's not yeah. the same thing as courage. Yeah. That's just determination and browbeating yourself into that's submission. Yeah. And that's not a very loving thing to do to yourself, I I even if no one else is involved. Yeah, and, and since I'm beginning to... Um, really feel more, not just know more, but feel more what loving means to myself, which mm -hmm. has been the, the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see what I did in the past with all my achievements. They were very unloving, mm -hmm. you know, and I would never do them again. Maybe I would do, I would strive for the same thing, but totally differently, you in know. A, in with a different the, manner. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, my focus would be very different, yeah. you know. So that big word down there in all of this has been very important and yeah. Mary's suggestion now when she gave that illustration just hit it on the nail for me. So yeah. thank you, Mary. Yeah. See, she often does that. She doesn't realise it. I've heard a lot of people say that. And then she just told me not to not make a fuss about it. <laughs> <laughs> Who was talking then? Sorry? Sol. Oh, Sol. Yes. Sol. Hey, no, Sol. <laughs> Lots of people say that. Yeah. Very okay, thanks. Um, um, 
the other day, I was so passionate about God, and I thought God is everything, and He's loving, and I didn't have much fear then. And I, um, I said to a lady, uh, oh, it's so confronting. She might be listening. So uh, I said, um, giving a drug to the cancer patient, I don't know if it's loving, because um, God is everything. God never gives pain who can't handle, and that's the, uh, that's the result of the, um, of the law of attraction. And um, oh, it's afraid. <laughs> um, in, a, in a group of divine love people, and I said, um, that's comment. I don't know if it's loving. And everybody else was uh, sort of against me. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's not. You don't understand. And I was so hit by the fear yeah. to trust uh, about loving things, about God. And it's already passed four weeks since that happened. It's still stuck in me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to process this um, emotion. Maybe I wanted to everyone to agree with me mm -hmm. and I wanted to uh, say the truth but I can't say the truth. Were you surrounded <laughs> by women or men or is there a mixture? Right mixture, most women. Mostly women. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's the words I see the love and truth and courage and I thought I had but I don't think I have it yet. Mm -hmm. And um, <sighs> My feeling towards become anger. Listen to me. Yeah. This is the truth. Why no, nobody understand me? Yeah. And I thought, um, Ken was with me. And I thought everybody was against me, but Ken would agree with me, but he was other side for maybe one, two hours. And then he start um, sort of, I uh, oh, understand now things, but... Um, these things happen many times before. If I say something, everyone against me. Yeah. So that's a law of attraction yeah. event for yourself to look at okay. in terms of what's happening and why are people against you for saying truth. Yeah. So when you say truth, oftentimes people are against you because of the other emotions you have of the fear of their response. Yeah. Does that make well, sense? So you're very so afraid. Yep. Can I just correct one thing you said though? That God never gives us a pain we can't bear. You hear this statement quite a lot. Yeah. Can I just correct that and say God never gives you any pain ever? Oh, oh so uh, we made Exactly. Oh. We made the pain that we yeah. are in. And this is a very powerful thing to understand when you start looking at the physical pain you experience. God never gave you any of it. Mm. We give it to ourselves by breaking God's law, making the choice to break God's law in some way. So let's, let's take that right to the end with, say, a cancer patient who's obviously, if they're near the end of their life, in a large deal of pain. Yeah. This large deal of pain was created by themselves and some of the emotion that they're holding on to within themselves. Yeah. Now, on the planet, there is still this big thing that goes on. And I'm, I'm not saying to not have compassion for that, right? Because it's very important to have compassion for other people's pain. Like... Otherwise, you'd have no compassion for anybody because uh, almost everybody's in pain at some point, right? Mm. So I'm not saying don't have compassion for a person's pain, but I am saying that there needs to be an understanding inside of each person if they really want to grow spiritually and positively that my pain is actually my creation. Mm. If it wasn't, then it would be somebody else's creation, right? Like, so... so you know, and the, the truth is that all pain we experience is a creation at some level of our own. Now, I'm not saying, and this is going to be, sound quite strange, but let's take it to the full degree. Let's say I'm abused as a child, right? sexually abused as a child. How does this apply, that my pain is part of my creation? Well, I may have been sexually abused as a child, but now that I'm an adult... I have chosen to hold on to the pain of that childhood experience. 
So you didn't create the so pain. So I didn't in your create child. the pain in my child in this in this mode. It was my parents or the environment that created it. But my, the fact that I'm now in pain is the result of my holding onto it. So it is still partly my creation because I'm holding onto it and not releasing it. The truth is that every part, bit of pain that you feel, you'll get to the point eventually where someone can actually harm your physical body. You'll feel a painful bit of pain in your body, but after a while you'll even be able to detune from that pain itself due to what's going on inside of your soul because all pain actually is a result of fear at one level or another. Now, it's very interesting to experiment with this if you want to try. And that is that if you are afraid of getting a deep tissue massage or something, what you do is you go along, get somebody to give you a deep tissue massage in one area of your body. Let's say it's your back. And you get someone really digging in and allow yourself to experience the pain. Like allow yourself to actually tune in and experience So that pain. means you keep breathing and you don't brace. And so you breathe and you try to remain relaxed while this pain is going on. Instead of, you know how what we do is we tense up? That's the fear in operation, right? So you need to stay relaxed, feel the pain, breathe, feel the pain, breathe, feel the pain, breathe. What you'll find happens is you'll go through this barrier and into a state where the person's still doing the deep tissue massage but you will not experience any pain from it. Right? And that would demonstrate to you that actually all pain is the result of fear. Right? All pain we experience is the result of fear. So it's very important to understand that when we make the statement, God never gives us any too much pain that we can't bear or something to that effect, what we're really saying is that God is to blame for our pain or God was the creator of our pain and that is a total untruth. Right? It is our own desire to oppose God's laws at some level that create our pain. Right? So for example, someone comes up and murders you. Right? Well, no, no, there's heaps of spirits here who have experienced that. So, so it's, I'm not the only one here who's experienced it. But someone comes up and murders you and, and there are a heap of people affected by that murder here left on the earth, are there not? Now, every one of those people would feel a degree of pain, emotional pain. Why are they experiencing the pain? Because there is something inside of themselves that is disharmonious with love that creates that pain. Because in the end, you can actually go through a murder experience of your own partner, for example, and not feel any pain as a result of the experience. Right? Now, obviously, to do that, we need to get into a state where we've dealt with lots of our fear. Right? Because it's only our fear that actually creates the pain. So up until the state where we're, where we're at one with God, below that state, basically... We are going to have some fear left in us, so therefore there is always going to be some pain associated with our life in some degree. Does that make sense to everyone? As soon as I enter that at one minute state, there is now no longer any fear left within me, is there? So in that state, now, there is also not going to be any pain possible for me to experience of any type, emotional, physical or any type. And what will happen is you'll feel it happen, but all of a sudden you, you're allowing every emotion to pass through you and every experience becomes pleasant, believe it or not. Right? So AJ, you're saying in that state there'd be no grief at all, even if it just passed through you? There'd be no grief at all, at all within the person. So, so any person who's been murdered often leaves a lot of grieving people left on earth. And every one of those people is experiencing their own pain about their own false beliefs about love. Because remember, any time I'm in pain, I am not in harmony with love. Any time. Emotionally or physically, if I'm in pain, I'm not in harmony with love. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so if that's the case... And what we need to do is every time I feel pain at some level, like emotional pain, physical pain, doesn't matter, 
any pain at some level, as, as soon as I feel it, I know there's something out of harmony with love. So at the moment, I've got a pain in my right shoulder. So, just here. Oh, left shoulder, sorry. <laughs> Myself and Mary constantly get our rights and lefts. <laughs> we're both, we're both left-handed, you see. So, so, so. So, so I've got a pain in my left shoulder. That's about some area that I'm out of harmony with love. I've got this really strong pain across here, like I said yesterday, with a torn, sort of like a torn muscle type feeling across here that's preventing my breathing. That's something out of harmony with love. Does that make sense? And if I, if I start from that awareness, then I can pray about it. But if I go, oh, you know, let's go and take the pill, like let's go and take the, you know, painkiller, what am I really trying to do? I'm trying to get away from the fact that I am out of harmony with love. Can you see that? And I'm making a choice, an active choice to actually harm that. Now, so therefore, Hiroko's statement to the group is true. That actually, giving a cancer patient a drug is not necessarily a loving thing to do. Or particularly to force them to have it. It's not a necessarily a loving thing to do. All right? And in fact, it creates lots of other problems in their body. However, the problem also is that a person who has cancer to the point where they're in so much pain is obviously in huge emotional denial. Right? So at some point, we've got to balance, in our compassion, we've got to balance what's going on for, for them. Now, do, does this, if I was a person who was trying to um, nurture a person who's a cancer patient, in terms of through the last days of their, of their life, I'd be asking myself the question, does this person really want to deal with this emotion? Now, if they did, I would be perfectly happy to try to assist them in any way I could, both to alleviate the pain and suffering, which, by the way, remember, is caused by their fear. Right? So how would I alleviate it? By helping them deal with their fear and, and I would also be very, very happy to help them with the actual cancer problem itself, which is related to an issue with regard to an emotion that they need to be willing to deal with. But if the person was just projecting at me, you've got to fix me, you've got to make this right, you've got to take away my pain, well, actually that person's projecting exactly those emotions at God many times. And does God do that? No. Well, if God doesn't do that, why would I then choose to do it myself? Can you see? I'm basically saying to myself that actually I know better than God about how to deal with this particular issue. And this is where a lot of people get very confronted. And you can understand why, can't you? Like I'm saying, all right, God doesn't do it, so should I. My celestial spirit friends don't do it, so should I. When I'm in a place of love, will I do it? When I'm in a place of at one moment with God and at one moment with truth, at one moment with love, will I do what they're expecting of me? The answer is no. Right? Because God doesn't do it and the celestial spirits don't do it. They're all in a place of harmony with divine love in their at one moment with God. So I wouldn't do it even if I was on earth here. Now, can you see how confronting that's going to be? No, a person knowing that you have the power through this connection with God to heal them and yet you cannot do it right? because of the choices that they are making in disharmony with love and because of the fact that God doesn't even do it. Right? So does God have the power right now to totally wipe out all of your ailments and illnesses? Does it physically have the power? Yes, is the answer. The question then has to be asked, is God the most loving being in the universe? Yes. Do we believe that? Yes. Well, God, the most loving being in the universe... Uh, not everyone in this audience believes it. Not that everyone in the audience believes it, but let's, let's go with that. God, the most loving being in the universe, doesn't wipe out your pain willy-nilly. Why? Because the pain is the effect of a cause that is created from within ourselves. And to wipe out the effect of the pain would actually cause us to do things that are disharmonious with love even more, would it not, in most cases. So God doesn't do it. 
And the question I need to always ask myself is, why then do I do it? And most of the time, we have deep fears going on and deep feelings going on. One of my deep fears is when I see somebody who is in a place of distress, I just feel like I want to help them get out of that distress. Does that make sense? My fear is seeing them in the distress. Does that make sense to everyone? And you probably relate to that if you see a car accident or something and, and just all of a sudden the feeling of distress. Now, there's a whole different feeling between compassion for a person's circumstance and actually trying to alleviate the effects of their situation without addressing the causes. Now, I would feel perfectly comfortable helping them with the cause of the issue. Right? As, by the way, would God. Right? But a lot of the times what I finish up doing is I want to address the effects because I think this is cruel. Where they're in is very cruel and very sad and everything else. But we're not addressing the cause. And this is something that we need to also address at some point in the future when we talk about cause and effect. But when it comes back to our discussion about desiring positively, positive change, what we need to do is look at why do we assist people, including ourselves, to avoid the cause of our own illnesses and pains and problems. And the real reason is because we don't desire positive change. What we want is a quick fix. We want someone to come along and wipe it all clean for us so we have a clean slate start again, but without learning anything in the process. That's what we want many times. Hello, you were saying earlier, AJ, that unless they want to address the cause, what I feel is difficult is how to diagnose to what level they want to address the cause, not so much the disease itself. How yeah. do you do that and how long do you give them to address the cause before you go back to compassion, not healing? You know, where... How, we need to be pretty developed, do we not, to be able to feel if they're really going to address it or just say they are? I always go back again to what does God do? So what does God do? Yeah, so, so what would God do? In, what is God doing in this situation right now? So I'm, I try to stay sensitive to what God is doing with this person. So if I'm having a conversation with them and all of a sudden their pain is lessening, then I know that actually, yeah, there's some kind of recognition of an emotion going on in here. There's some kind of change happening with them and God is lessening their pain through that process. So I know I can continue helping them. But if, if all of a sudden their pain intensifies, now I know their fear is intensifying. Now I've got to ask myself the question, do I want to help them deal with their fear? Do you want to deal with your fear? And if I start talking to them about their fear and then their, their pain lessens, then I know they do want to deal with some of that fear, so I keep talking, I keep, keep trying to help. But, it's, but if the pain, pain doesn't lessen, then I know straight away, well, no, hang on a sec, there's a resistance to your fear here and you don't want to deal with that. What can I do? There's nothing I can do now that's harmony in harmony with love. Does that make sense? Most people who are in a lot of pain want you to cure their pain, but they don't want you to help, you help them cure the cause of their pain. Right? And what we want to do in our own progression towards God is want to address the real issues. The real issue is the cause of our pain, what's really creating it, the creation that we have manifested within ourselves by our denial of something within ourselves about love. And that's what we need to do, is to see it as an opportunity. So I see this physical pain that I'm in right now as an opportunity. Sometimes I feel a bit self-punishing. I go, yeah, here I go again. You know, how many times in the last month I've said to Mary, uh, yeah, dead arm, dead left arm again. Like, you know, it feels like sometimes like someone's punched me in the arm. You know, when someone come along when you were a child at school and punched you in the arm, just punched you and... And it goes dead and you can, you know, then there's this ache in it. And that's how my arm feels, like, in cycles. Like, so the last two days now it's been feeling like that. Like someone's punched me in the arm. It's just like, uh, 
and I'm walking around, oh, okay, there's something about women, I've got no idea what it is, and I'm <laughs> avoiding it, and I'm not loving myself. <laughs> and then, of course, there's this tendency to go, and I'm down on myself, and aren't I stupid? What, what's going on with me? And you need to get out of all that place and get into the place where, okay, what's this about? Right, this is about something that's going on right now. And when I allow myself to feel about it and feel about women in the interactions I'm having with them and so forth, then I start feeling what the arm's about. Yeah? What's this pain here about? Well, that came on two nights ago and I know what brought that on. My denial of a whole heap of sadness related to my relationship with God, right? And because we've been talking all for the last two days and stuff, I haven't had the opportunity to deal with it. Or I could say that I wasn't, didn't have the guts to counsel the last two days, which is probably what I should have done if I loved myself, right? And focused on this emotion. Does that make sense? Now, my feelings are, oh, I'd just disappoint, I said to Mary, you know, I'd just disappoint 200 people um, who've made plans for the weekend and I don't want to do that. And that was more important to me than my love of myself, which is actually a part of my problem. Does that make sense? So, so how can I then say, oh, it's all your fault that I've got this pain when in rea and please take it away from me, when in reality I created it by holding on to the emotion. So I've got to work through the issue emotionally. Well, why am I doing that? Do you follow me? And when I do that, everything starts working out. I start feeling what love is all about for myself as well. I was just thinking that you and I are pretty funny. You know how, like, older people, this is very stereotypical now, <laughs> but, you know, they often, I've worked with lots of oldies and um, often what they can tell you about is like a catalogue of, like, this hurts and then I've got that, <laughs> and, you know. And, and sometimes I think AJ and I are kind of like this old couple, like, oh, I've got this thing in my back <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> But instead of talking about the medications we take, we go, I think, okay, it's on this side. And so, well, what was I thinking about? And how does it, yeah, what have you got going on? And because since I started this path, like everything collapsed. <laughs> it's interesting. It comes back. It's like interesting that before you start the path, you feel quite good in your body. But that's because you're, that's because you're in total denial of its pain, right, most of the time. And then you start becoming aware of its pain and then it's, it's painful everywhere. <laughs> what, what do I do with that? Yeah. 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 But it's pretty amazing. Like I haven't had asthma very badly for like years and about three weeks ago, looking at you, um, three weeks ago, <laughs> <laughs> it just hit me like I couldn't breathe. I was like I waking up in the night, total, total asthma. We dealt with some fear and it's all gone. Like just like that, it really... So as the emotions rise in you, your body pains will change. Does that make sense? So, so don't, a lot of people look upon body pain as, an, as, an, as a sign that a person is not spiritual. Do you, you follow me? If you're in pain physically, then you, there's something going wrong spiritually. Well, well, there is something going on spiritually, and a lot of times what it is is a growing awareness within you of an emotion that you're still denying the experience of. So what, when, you start, when you start on the divine love path, sometimes you feel quite good physically, and then all of a sudden, because of a growing awareness within you, some emotion starts to rise within you, and because I now want to suppress that emotion, which I've done most of my life with it, but now I've got an awareness of it, I can't suppress it as well as I could before, and so what finishes up happening is my body starts creating the pain, indicating that I need to release this, I need to release this. So I've been through lots and lots and lots of physical pain through the process. So while my body looks quite healthy, um, I've had to deal with lots of pain where sometimes, like, there was one time I remember, I think I told you about, where I was just laying on a couch for three weeks with a feeling of somebody kicking me in my balls and, and, and every single moment for three weeks. And I'd just lay there and then I remember once John rang me and, and uh, and, and I had to get to the phone, so I, I go down on the floor and I <laughs> crawl across the floor and pick up the phone and then just lay on the floor while, <laughs> while I'm uh, talking to him. And then he says, what's, what's going on with you? I said, oh, I just feel like I've been kicked in the walls, you know. <laughs> and, then he, and then he rings like, uh, wing, rings a week later, what's going on with you? Oh, I still feel like I've <laughs> and, and, and it's just my denial of an emotion. Once I actually work my way through the emotion itself, and then the feeling just like goes, it's to totally gone. 
So I've had times where I've worked through this emotion with my shoulder and within a moment it's just totally free again, easy, fine to feel everything. Y you will go through cycles where one day you're constipated, the next day you got diarrhea, and the next day and you're going, oh, the doctor again, you know, like, <laughs> um, but they don't often need to. But I'm not saying don't care for yourself either. So there are times when, there are times when you know something's wrong with your body and you want to buy yourself some time to deal with the emotion, if you can. So that under those circumstances, that's where medicine comes in handy, right? Because you can buy yourself some time to actually work your way through the emotion. But it's pointless using the medicine and then not working your way through the emotion. Because we've got a backlog. There's yeah, a backlog yeah. of emotion that we haven't dealt with. So yeah. when it all starts coming up, it can get yeah. intense. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about, sorry, Alana, you have to wait a little longer, is, uh, I talk too much, I know, but that's the way it goes. And one thing I need to talk about is, remember my illustration, I think it was yesterday, how I have frozen emotion at different ages. Right? One thing you need to remember is that um, if I'm passionately desiring to deal with my emotion, what's going to happen is I'm going to access emotion at the age that it was locked up inside of me emotionally. Does, it, does that make sense to everyone? So, so let's say when I was five, I got abused uh, sexually, but what happened was I was taken out of body by some spirits, so I didn't have to feel a lot of what was happening to my body. But when I came back into my body, there was all of the results of the abuse in my body that made me feel disgusting and, and, and shameful and so forth, right? But my, I went to mummy to talk to mummy about that and she shut me down and she told me, no, it didn't happen, grow up, and if, I do, if you come and talk to me again about it, I'll give you a belt, and, right? So in that place now, I've locked up that shame and I've locked up that feeling of this dirty, this dirty disgusting feeling. Does that make sense? But it's a five-year-old emotion. In other words, it happened when I was five and it's going to be locked up at that age inside of me, like a frozen piece of m emotion inside of me. And then, and then when I was seven, another event happened, let's say. So I was seven years old and another event occurred where, where the emotion got locked up and at that time I was seven years of age and it was all locked up inside of me. Unexpressed. Now, some of it might have gotten expressed, but some of it not, you see. Now, you can see that as I go, as I go back dealing with my emotion, as I'm focusing on desiring this change inside of me, I will start accessing these events. And you're going to feel that age as you do it. Because the emotion is in that age. All right? So, um, a lot of people say to me, um, and this is why I wanted to raise it, is a lot of people say, oh, I had this emotional experience where I was in my mother's womb and I had this feeling and that feeling going on and this feeling going on. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is not good. Why am I feeling this? But let's put us down into the womb for a moment. I suppose without Still the dress. Still dressed, yeah. Without the dress. <laughs> yeah. You know that's a symbol of femininity anyway. Huh? So, so we're down in the womb now. Do you have any conscious recollection of being in the womb? You don't, do you? Do you even have a conscious recollection of when you were one? Most of us don't, do we? It's by the time we start getting to two, we start having our earliest memories a lot of the times, and three, we start to remember a few things and so forth. And, our, and that's because of the development of our brain and a lot of other factors, right? Now, if a person is telling me about a womb-based emotion... How do they know it's a womb-based emotion? The answer is there is no way you could know it's a womb-based emotion without somebody else telling you. Who would tell you? Spirit. Only a spirit will tell you. Why would they tell you? To get you out of the emotion. See, a lot of times people... People say, oh, I had this womb-based experience, it was wonderful, and we went, went through you know, this rebirthing process. Why do you think it's so much connected? Why do you think rebirthing processes are so much connected with past life regressions? Because they're spirit-driven, you see. 
And so, so what happens is, what happens is that when you feel these womb-based emotions, you will not have an intellectual recollection of it, usually until after the experience and only if you have some spirits with you telling you what it was about. And often they're telling us what it's about because actually when we're going through it, we have these huge emotions about them and we want to know what it's about because we feel quite distressed. And so, of course, the spirit comes along and says, oh, I'll make you less distressed, I'll make you less distressed. Here you go, this is what it's about. You don't have to worry about that because this is what it's about. All right? The truth is that actually as you go back, you'll get to a point where you're, as you're dealing with emotion, you're only feeling the emotion. And there won't be these like recollections so, of, oh, in my womb, mum did this, that, and it happened, that happened. That all finishes up coming usually from a spirit telling you. So, AJ, you're saying we don't have a, like, we don't have a conscious memory. We have an emotion within us. Always the emotion. Yep. And so we would have a sensory sort of feeling around all it. Feelings. But it, yeah, yeah. yeah. It wouldn't be a... A cognitive No, not a cognitive. So some people come up and tell me this long story of all the things that happened in their mum's womb and I'm going, yeah, how did you find out all that? Somebody had to tell you, right? All right. So, so obviously it's, if, if it's not your mum who told you, there has to be a spirit, right? Somebody had to tell you what was going on because at that time your brain wasn't even developed enough to have the cognition to even know what was going on. You only had feelings. So, so you'll get to a stage where you're prepared to just feel these feelings without knowing what they are. And a lot of those kind of feelings are related to times when you were under two years of age. And you'll be able to feel those feelings and release them and be completely content with not knowing what they are. Right? And if you desire positive change, you won't be always projecting in a spirit, please tell me, please tell me, please tell me, please let me know what this is about so that I don't have to feel it completely. That's really what you're saying. Please tell me what it's about so that I can understand it. And the truth is you don't un have to understand it. You just need to feel it and it will be gone. Does that make sense? Ivana, can you? Um, so for as long as I can remember, I've had chronic fatigue. Um, and I have been sort of trying to, well, intellectually <laughs> work it out why I have it. Um, and because I just feel exhausted all the time and my sisters pay me out and they're like, oh, you're so lazy and all this sort of stuff. But it's because I am really tired like, mm -hmm. and they just don't understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but one thing I have noticed actually is when I'm um, actually following my desires, I'm not tired. Exactly. Um, so <laughs> Can you see the Can relationship see what the of what's <laughs> happening every other, for the rest of the time? Yeah. Whose desires? Are you following then? The rest Mine. Who are, the, who are you oh. following when you have chronic fatigue? Um, well, I'm not following my desires, so are you someone else's. Someone else's? Yeah. Whose? Um, maybe my mum's. Exactly. <laughs> okay, because mum's got chronic fatigue too. As well. Oh. Yeah. Interestingly <laughs> enough. And yeah. chronic fatigue is a result, actually of us hooking into what other people want from us oh. and, and spending most of our life trying to give those things to them. So you're giving out constantly. Oh, and, okay. And you're giving out constantly, giving out constantly, giving out constantly to get, and our addiction is what we're going to get in return. What do you get when you're giving out constantly? You get well, maybe approval, yeah. maybe accept. So what you've got to do is look at your addiction to it and okay. what, why you're addicted to it. But chronic fatigue is actually the result of you giving out constantly to somebody because you want something in return that yeah. you're striving for, but you're giving out so much energy that there's none left for yourself even to maintain your own body anymore. Okay. So you're just tired all the time. And this is why when you're in your own desires, you don't seem to have it. Yeah. Um, and also another thing that I have is psoriasis. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad has that as well. Mm -hmm. And because it's actually in my ears now, it's been inside my ears for like, oh, I don't know, over coming up to three years now. Mm -hmm. And it's on my eyelids as well. So I'm just, 
intellectually believing, oh, yeah, well, it's because I don't want to hear something and I don't want to see something or, you know, mm -hmm. I've got it on my head as well. And a lot of people actually don't realise, unless I've got my hair up and you can see the bits, yeah. um, the back of my ears and stuff. Yeah. Um, so, and I know you've said that um, skin things are to do with, like, rage. Um, so... Because my dad has it and my dad's mum has it as well. Mm -hmm. She's got it all over her body. So, mm -hmm. you know, like raw, itchy skin, like yep. completely covering her. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I, <laughs> I want to ask you because <laughs> yes. I don't want to feel it myself. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's better if you feel it yourself. Yeah, because yeah. an idea that I actually came up with, um, I think, a a week or two ago was to actually because like my scalp like my skin is itchy all the time mm. and what i used to do was actually scratch at it mm. but and like when it first started coming up um like it started like as a mosquito bite sized bit on the back of my scalp and then i just would scratch at it okay. and it would just keep spreading so yeah. it was this raw like bleeding thing like i would scratch at it at night time when i'm asleep as well yeah. And I would wake up and there's like crusty blood on the back of my scalp. And um, so now it's spread more, but it's not sort of that bad. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I came up with an idea to not touch my skin at all. Because <laughs> I think I'd feel like I was going crazy. Because um, it's constantly itchy yeah. um, and hot and stuff as well. Yeah. So I tried that for a little bit. Um, but didn't get very didn't far. Didn't get very far. No. No. But. So what do you do? Well, I'm just avoiding it right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing is that you're really asking what do you do? Yeah. To, to get rid of the problem. The, the issue you've got to ask yourself though is that, all right, now my dad has that. So yep. with your, with your um, chronic fatigue, your mum had, um, and with this particular issue your dad has, right? So. Which side of your body is it occurring on mostly? It's actually worse on my right side. Right. Okay. So. Um, so. On you oh, sort of. Because um, it's on the back of like my earlobe here. Yeah. So, but it's not on that side here. Yeah. But it's um, a symmetrical type thing. Like whatever happens on one side generally Finishes happens. Finishes up going to the um, other. Yeah. Yep. But so, so what you need to do now is just uh, what, what I do with a lot of things that I don't know the answer to is I just feel into the pain of it. Um, so what I do is I allow myself to feel the pain, like this in my arm. All right, so I say, all right, I'm in denial of something. I don't know any idea what it is. Let myself feel into the pain of my arm. And I, as I feel into it, what happens is I start connecting to some sadness about it and things like that that start coming up and I just allow myself to feel that sadness rise. like. Just the sadness of and 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 the uh, pain, you know, in the pain itself, the sadness of the pain itself. So just allow myself to, to to get into the sadness of the pain of what's going on with my arm. And as I do that, a lot of times, uh, if I also have a long interval just to help me through this process emotionally, I start to get into because you don't have to intellectually know what it's about. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is process the emotion of what it's about. Does yeah. that make sense? So what I do is I just settle into that pain and settle into the feeling of always being in pain in my arm. And you can feel as I'm doing that now, my emotions start coming up of, of sadness, right? Just start rising within me about how painful that is. And, and what I do is I just allow that to go deeper and deeper and deeper until I'm actually in, my, in a grieving place. And ironically, hey, I can feel all the... As soon as I did that with you just now... I feel a lot less pain in my arm than I've been feeling right up to that moment. Right. Yeah, um, and because I also have back pain all the time and neck pain and, yep. and everything as well, and I've tried doing that and I just, instead of trying to ignore it, which does not work, mm. <laughs> um, I sit with it and sort of, um, I don't know how to explain it, but yeah, I guess it's just sort of focusing on one area of that pain to say it's my lower back mm -hmm. and then the pain just sort of goes a bit <laughs> and it's weird, but I don't necessarily actually get into an emotion either. Yeah. I can just sort of... If it keeps recurring, then you're not getting into the cause. Yeah. My suggestion yeah. is to go deeper. And so with my shoulder, it keeps recurring. So what I do there is I just go into the emotion of it, into like I just showed, showed you, into 
in, and eventually I started crying about it. And then, and then usually after I'm crying about it, feelings arise within me about what it's actually about. And it feels to me like it's about taking responsibility for women's emotion at the moment. Like, so, so, so that I, I just trust that. And then, and then I allow myself to connect with when I've done that and how I've done that and what I do when I do that and how I deny myself when I do that and all of those kind of emotions that are associated with it. You wanted to say? No, I'm done. Oh, I was just going to say with the itching, because I have uh, different itching things that happen, uh, and I just noticed what was happening r right about the time I got really itchy, like my eyes itch and I used to have it really chronically as a kid and that just reoccurred for I me also recently. Have that as well. Yep. And I I really once I started to just observe what emotion I was going through at the time that they started to itch, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. It was all about for me that particular thing was about me judging myself and it, and I would just it, once I figured it out, or like once I had the realization, then every time I'd get an itchy eye, I'd just go, oh my gosh, I'm doing it again. This is total, and it was an avoidance actually yeah. of feeling other stuff, so. So I'd say to Mary at that time, like at the moment you're itching your eyes because you're wanting to avoid the underlying emotion that, 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 that the itchy eyes is actually covering. And, and while you're itching your eyes, you're actually in the panic of avoiding the underlying emotion. And once you, once you actually allow yourself to stop doing that and feel what's this underlying emotion, for Mary, a lot of times it's been like some sexual shame or something like that, and then judgment of herself. So she feels some sexual shame, doesn't want to feel that emotion, feels judgmental of herself for not doing it, for not doing it right, for not getting it right or whatever, and then straight away into the itchy eyes. And so you can reverse the situation quite a lot. A lot of itchiness is about anger towards yourself or towards others. And a lot of it's anger towards yourself. Oh, okay. Bites as well, by the way. So yeah, I really get bitten bites a lot. All the time. <laughs> what happens is there's a lot of anger usually towards yourself. Yeah. So there's a lot of self-judgment going on there. So, you know, again, look at those issues emotionally. Well, that's interesting then thinking of my grandma because she's got it all over her body. All over her body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing I was also going to ask um, uh, with the back pain... Um, is it avoiding my emotions if I was to get a, like a deep tissue massage but then feel like the emotions that come up when I... Mm. See, like again, it depends on your intention. Yeah. You, you might, a lot of people go to get a massage because they want to be relieved of the pain. Yeah, because that's what I used to so, do. So if that's your intention, then of course that's not really going to deal with the cause. But if your cause is to actually while you're getting the massage to actually feel the pain and start crying while you're on the table while you're getting a massage, which not many people finish up doing, then that's a great thing to do. So, okay. so like the other week I went along and had a massage. Uh, we, we have a massage therapist across the road from us in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and uh, it's great actually. And then, so what I went is went along to the massage and she started massaging on my chest region and I was just crying and crying and, and like, you know, even though I was getting condescension projected at me from everyone that was there still, um, I still allowed myself to continue to cry and just allow, allow whatever it is to come up to come up and eventually I connect with what the emotion is. Does that make sense? So again, yep. it depends on your intention. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. What's the time, peoples? No worries. What's the time, Mr Wolf? You remember playing that when you were little? <laughs> It was a terrible game, isn't it? It was so boring. Well, it's not just boring. It's like, it's just the whole concept of having one group of people over here and one group of people over here and having a person in the middle who has to chase somebody. And, like, it's so alienating in a way, isn't it, emotionally? Like, I, I often think about that. And what we're going to try to do in the future, and perhaps rather than answer some of these questions you've got, can I just talk about some of the things we want to do in the future with you? Um, sorry? Oh, you're giving me the hard word about your, for your, your uh, workshops. Okay, okay. No, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't doing that. No, I'm not changing what I'm going to do. <laughs> and, and I wasn't. <laughs> What's the be careful? That's all right. What's the be careful projection, darling? 
You don't want your thunder stolen from your workshops. It's not about thunder, babe. It's all about shock value. Ah, yes. <laughs> Mary wants to retain the shock value for the workshops. Now, what, we went, what we're going to do is, um, firstly, um, quite a few of you have expressed that you'd like to have a five-minute time up the front where you express about your own journey on the divine love path since you've come to know it. So who would like to have that opportunity to do that? So there's one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. There's a good 25, 30 of us, right, who would like to do that. Um, what I would like to do is have one session where we do that, where we have the opportunity to express how we've been going on the Divine Love Path. Then what we'd like to do, as I pointed out yesterday, is we want to have the second day of these two-day sessions, if we have any more after a month's time. Um, we want to have the second day of the two-day session being a little bit more practical for you. Right? So what we want to try to do, um, myself and Mary, is devise some things uh, to help you connect with the childlike emotions that, you, that we often are still denying within ourselves in a more practical setting. Does that make sense? And so we'll be able to stack up the chairs and move them away and, uh, and have the space here to be able to help people go through some of these practical things um, which should help uh, actually connect to some of the emotions. And um, so, so that's another thing we'd like to do as well. Um, in the future. So we talk about content, if you like, on the first day and the second day, uh, shake up the emotion around it a bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so the content might be um, developing a desire, for example. Let's say that's the content. And then the, the second day would be about, all right, who of you has a desire to dance right now? We put on some music and we do a bit of dancing, right? Who would like to do some karaoke right now or whatever and get up front and sing? And we do some of that. And just, we also want to uh, do some things that you might have done as a child as well. So that, that'll be something that we'll work through uh, rather than give you too much information about it. Otherwise, the shock value gets, uh, <laughs> gets neglected. Um, so no. what, the reason why we would like to do that is because what we're finding um, is that we can talk about these things as long as you like. But unless you actually start to feel them and put them into practice yourself, the, the talking's not really going to be of very much long-term benefit. The talking does open up your awareness, but if you can't get into the emotion, and there's the frustration of getting an emotion, then what else does it really do? Not, not much else for you. Does that make sense? So what we want to do is do, it in the, do some things that are practical that will help you get a bit more into the emotions of what's going on and particularly into your desires and your childlike desires. Does that make sense? Because there's so much judgment about childlike, being childlike in your desires. Many of us have some really strong passions, but we're so afraid of telling anybody about them because we're afraid of the judgment, the condescension, people thinking it's stupid and all those other things. Many of us also have many hidden truths you know, things that you're ashamed of in your life that you've never told anybody about. Right? And at some stage, you're going to need to get these out of you. So how's that going to happen without you starting to tell somebody? And these are, so what we want to do is create some opportunities to deal with different things. Coming up to, um, once I get over this emotion I'm in at the moment, uh, to a degree, I want to start having a session, a series of sessions talking about God specifically. About God's uh, characteristics and attributes and qualities and about developing a passion for God, about God reliance, about prayer, a bit more about prayer. And I want to focus on those, uh, God, uh, God's nature, if you like, so that you can start to feel God's, as a, you feel God personally Rather than, you know, every time we speak of God, many still have these concepts of God related to their religious practices or their lack of religious practices or, or whatever has happened in the past. And what we want to do instead of that is start opening you up to the concept of a loving God inside of your heart, someone who you can open up to emotionally. 
and someone who you can develop a personal relationship with. I think these sessions will be really fantastic and I've been encouraging AJ to give them and he said to me the other day that I think if I gave them at the moment I'd just cry all the way through and I said I think that would be fantastic. Mm. So, so I have got a lot of emotions about them and, and partly what I'm going through at the moment is about um, sort of reconnecting to many of those emotions about God that I've had all my life and, and um, what I'd like to do is to share the feelings uh, that I have about God and also what I know to be truths about God with you and so, so that you can come to get to know God a little bit more intimately perhaps than, than we do at this stage. And I feel what that will do is will help you open up more rapidly to receiving God's love. Um, and that's obviously the most important part of the divine love path. Like dealing with your emotions needs to be done, but it's not something that actually, in the end, you'll be completely open emotionally, so you'll always be an emotional being. But what will actually happen is that there won't be too many, or any, in fact, once you're at one with God, negative emotions within you. So don't you think from then on it's going to be all positive expression of positive emotions, but you'll still be emotional. But growth after that is very dependent upon your passion for God and very dependent upon what you wish to learn from God and what kind of relationship you want with God. So um, I'd like to, over the next, uh, probably in a month or two's time after I've gotten through this emotion, hopefully, in that time I'd like to present a lot of that information to you. Um, and I feel that when we do that, if as a group we'll get a bit closer to God, and what we want to do is change the flavour of any type we get together to being a celebration about our relationship with God. Um, so we've learnt, most of us have learnt enough now to know the principles involved in following the divine truth path. Right? So while I have many more subjects we could easily talk about, most of us know the basic principles now. Many of us have been hearing them for many months. There's literally like nearly 400 hours of DVDs now on the subjects of all these different subjects relating to the divine truth path. Now what we'd like to do is actually grab all that material and put it into practice and actually celebrate our relationship with God through the practice of that material. Does that make sense? And so um, that's what we're hoping to do um, rather than just speaking about it anymore. <coughs> if that makes sense to you, um, that's what we'd like to achieve. I think that's about all the people, what we needed to inform people about. And we both love you very much and we both feel quite strongly that uh, many of you are in a state where you're coming up to your core emotions but feeling quite confronted with those emotions and the process of those emotions. So we feel quite strongly that the next few months where Mary's doing her workshops and, and what we have in, in, in terms of um, trying to evolve these seminars into something a bit more personal, hopefully will assist you to get through them. And many of you are feeling quite depressed and down at times and a lot of that is because of uh, some heavy spirit influence that is occurring at the moment in terms of wanting people to stop their processing work. And so I would just like to encourage you to continue to have faith and to look sincerely at the emotions that cause you to be hooked into spirits and their projections at you and, uh, and try to work your way through those with, with a lot of prayer with, with God because they are the things that... Uh, this is, this is a time that many people walk away. Like, there's been thousands and thousands of people on earth since I began this work, uh, this century, who've heard this truth, but the majority of them have gotten to a key point in their progression and walked away. And the reason why is that they get so challenged emotionally that they don't go beyond that particular point and they lose their faith. They lose their desire and, and their, their image of what will happen afterwards. Because of the trauma that they've experienced in the past, they lose that. My suggestion is to just remind yourself and allow yourself to have, 
times where you just lay down perhaps and allow yourself to imagine what your life will be once you deal with a group, these groups of emotions and allow yourself to develop your faith and pray about faith. Pray about asking God to, to grow, help you grow your faith. And that will help you stay through this particular hard time. What's happening at the moment spiritually is that there are many spirits now who know that actually it's the divine truth that's entering the earth that's going to change the earth. So many of them up until now have had a many metaphysical type of explanations for the, divine, for, for the earth changes that they foresee. So as a spirit, what happens is you can foresee the future to a large degree, right? It, particularly as you become more developed. And this future then becomes well known in the spirit world in the lower spheres. So it becomes well known that eventually, ah, oh, there's going to be earth change events and there's going to be this area is going to be more damaged than that area. That is, so, these are things that are quite well known in the spirit world. So what, what happens is the spirits then look at how they can get things back to how it was, particularly the dark malevolent spirits. They want everything back to how it was. They want control. They want to be able to exercise all of their emotions through you and they want to keep everything as it is. They don't want everything to change and become different. So what they do is they focus on the people primarily who they know are going to be a part of the change. And as a result of that, the persons who are on the divine love path are going to be the people that they focus on. Does that make sense to you? And so we actually have, and I've mentioned this a few times now, we actually have a spiritual warfare going on for your soul at the moment. And this is why you feel so tired and exhausted at times. It's because you're feeling like, wow, what's going on here? I just feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. And it's not anybody necessarily in your close acquaintance that's causing it. And the reason is that there's a lot of spirit projection at you that obviously gets absorbed into you through the emotional hooks you have with spirits. And those emotional hooks are the same hooks you have that are unhealed with your parents. And this is why it's very, very important to deal with those parental-based emotions. So my suggestion is, if you haven't already done so, perhaps have a look at the book Toxic Parents. Um, it contains, Mary's just been reading it recently, and it contains many very good truths that will help you disconnect from the hooks that you have into your parents in order to get approval, acceptance, love and those other emotions. And that will also help you as you work your way through those. It will help you to actually disconnect from that spirit influence that's being projected at you a lot. And remember that prayer is the most important thing. And Mary, say. No, I just wanted to say that. I just think prayer is one of is the biggest tool in your toolkit right now and um, developing a desire for God and prayer, longing for God, uh, just I feel that is so important with regards to this issue of spirit influence that you're mm. referring to. Because uh, while you're praying a sincere prayer, all the spirits can't cope with the energy that's entering you from God, right? So, so if you bear that in mind that that is your greatest weapon <laughs> in this fight for your soul, it, you'll find that uh, it'll help you a lot, work your way through a lot of emotion and also retain your faith. It'll help you retain your faith. Um, I've seen so many people get to this point where many of you are at and leave the process. All right? And they leave it for all sorts of reasons, but the dominant one is that they lose faith. They just lose faith and they don't believe the truth anymore as a result of that. Millie, you want to... Um, if we can just have a mic. Would you? There's one just down here, Millie. This, is that right? He's coming. It's, oh, that's working. <laughs> I just wanted to share um, just a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Um, just recently, um, I've worked through some emotions and um, of rejection, 
and it's like um, a whole heap of stuff that I'd been carrying around for so long has just like lifted off me. So it's like a whole heap of spirits just that were there mm -hmm. has, and it's such a relief. And it, it was just the next day after I'd worked through the motions, the whole day I started to feel better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And I actually started to get rosy cheeks um, <laughs> so that's one thing. So what they were hooking into you is your feelings of rejection and they were constantly projecting at you their stuff to make you feel even worse. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. yeah. And um, this other message is um, something that my s guides told me a while ago and it's to help with faith. And it's like in my hand I have a golden seed of faith. It's already there in me. At the moment, it's buried under a whole heap of stuff, which is my emotional shit, excuse the word, <laughs> um, which is the buckets that I inherited from my parents. But in the end, that shit is going to fertile, is the fertilizer <laughs> for my golden seed and it's gonna just grow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's something the majority of us don't realise at this point, that many of your experiences that you're now going through that are quite painful are actually going to be such a joy for you in the future in the sense that you'll be able to help so many people work through exactly the same issues and you'll receive so much joy as a result of being able to do that. So while the experience has been painful, you'll find that in the end the experience, although painful, has given you this knowledge and ability to help so many people because of the experience. And so out of a lot of negative things, God always turns a lot of negative things into positive things through our process. The key for many of us is that while we're going through the negative things, we're often also not acting upon our desires and so we're not having any joy. So what we'd like to do too is start to activate some of the joy that's, that, that needs to be present inside of you and, and that will help you along this path. But it will be not a joy of getting, you know, suppressing your emotion but rather the joy of experiencing your emotion in a positive, in a positive fashion. And so what, what we want to do there is have a few sessions like a karaoke session and dancing and a few other things like that that uh, will probably, hopefully, help you experience some of that joy that's within you. There's no more that you would like to address. Thank you so much for your time again this weekend and for your <laughs> donations this weekend. See you later, everyone. And I, I look forward to seeing the growth that occurs over the coming months with all of this different work that you're doing on your emotions. So that's, we're really looking forward to seeing that. We'll catch you later.